because it's a Saturday, I, I allow a minute or two, you know, just day of rest and, no, that's tomorrow, okay. Uh, this is a panel that I am really, really excited about because uh, it, it is, everyone on the panel is either a Duke Law professor or has been a Duke Law professor. And I, I think it's a great way to show folks the superb quality of the faculty here at Duke Law School. And this faculty, you know, a military guy coming in after 34 years of service. Let's hear some surprise about that. I need to hear that can't be true. Uh, they've been so welcoming. But we have a world-class faculty here, especially in this area of presidential power. And our moderator, and I'm just going to introduce our moderator, and she's going to take care of our panelists. But uh, Professor Maggie Lemos, if you have taken a look at her bio, it is really eye-watering. And I, I sort of think, you know, Gosh, it is amazing for me, Villanova Law School grad, to be associated with these really superb, uh, superbly educated, superbly accomplished people. But that's not the most important thing about her. She is a, a, a great person to have as a colleague. I can go down, talk with her anytime I want, and she pretends like she's happy to see me, even if she's actually doing all kinds of other things. And uh, when I asked her to uh, moderate this panel, it was like she had been waiting for me to, to ask. So it was really, really wonderful to be able to work with these people. Just a, there was just one thing I want to highlight for about her uh, background. If you look, she uh, clerked for Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens. And in the world, since I've rejoined academia, the clerking is unbelievably competitive, difficult, and the aspiration of so many of our students, and the fact that she achieved that level is, is fantastic. The other important thing about her background, if you look at uh, the second page there, she was Duke's Distinguished Teaching Award. She won Duke's Distinguished Teaching Award in 2013. And I think that just reflects the kind of person that she is. She is not only a gifted academic, she's a gifted teacher, and really privileged to have her as a colleague. Maggie? Thank you, Charlie. Um, so I'm so happy to be here and have the chance to moderate this panel on presidential power and national security. We have a crack team of panelists um, here today all of whom have extensive experience in the executive branch, as well as in writing and teaching about constitutional law, presidential powers, and um, separation of powers. So I'm not going to say much about them. You have their full bios, uh, because I want to leave um, as much time as possible to hear what they have to say on the substance. Um, but just very briefly, our first speaker will be Jeff Powell, who's in the middle there. Um, Jeff is a professor of law here at Duke. He served recently as um, Deputy Assistant AG in the Office of Legal Counsel and prior to that in various other capacities in the Department of Justice. Um, Professor Powell has published a large stack of books, uh, but the most recent one is called uh, The President as Commander-in-Chief, so you can see why he's a perfect fit for, for this panel. Um, Chris Schrader will talk next. Um, Chris is the Charles S. Murphy Professor of Law and Public Policy Studies here at Duke, as well as being the co-director of our program uh, in public law. He, too, has many years of experience in the executive branch, serving most recently as Assistant Attorney General in the Office of Legal Policy, and before that as Acting Assistant Attorney, Attorney General in the Office of Legal Counsel. Uh, Professor Schrader teaches courses here on federal policymaking and uh, presidential power, and he, too, is working on a book on presidential power. Um, and last but certainly not least is Neil Kinkoff, who's professor of law at Georgia State University College of Law. He, too, has worked in the Office of Legal Counsel in the executive branch, as well as in other roles in the Department of Justice, the White House, and in Congress. Uh, and he has written extensively about presidential power, 
and the separation of powers and teaches courses in constitutional law and legislation, among others. So we are in good hands here. Um, each of our panelists will talk for about 20 minutes, and then I, I will give them a chance to ask questions of each other if, if any come up, um, and then open it up to all of you. And so hopefully we'll have time for lots of discussion. And with that, uh, Jeff, take it away. Thank you, Maggie, very much, and thank you, Charlie, for inviting me. The Constitution is the framework within which all U.S. government actions and decisions, political, military, legal, are made. For that reason, constitutional decisions about national security that, or that implicate national security or national security issues that implicate the Constitution are of the greatest practical importance and they are of the greatest topicality. They are everyday issues, or they should be. And because of this practical and topical significance, I want to talk about law school case books and ancient history. Um, <laughs> for those of you who did not have the pleasure of going to an American law school, the American legal case book is the paradigmatic teaching tool. Uh, when it was invented in the late 19th century, it consisted of nothing but judicial decisions. And although most modern casebooks uh, incorporate other kinds of things, their core remain an arrangement of cases on whatever the topic of the casebook is. A number of years ago, before September 11, 2001, I did a survey of the leading constitutional law casebooks because I was interested in seeing how they treated issues of presidential authority and national security. My discovery, uh, well, it wasn't really a discovery, my findings did not surprise me, uh, although I think they're very significant. It's true there were a few cases that uh, implicate uh, directly national security and the presidency. The 1952 Youngstown Steel seizure case, the 1971 uh, New York Times Pentagon Papers case. Now, they weren't put together. They were treated as, in one case, uh, a general separation of powers decision, and in the other, a First Amendment decision. Uh, I doubt that any student, unless the professor directed hers, her attention to it, would have put them together or seen the fact that they both deeply concern the scope of the president's power to act in defense of national security. All right, they're, they're separate, they're apart, they're, there's no linkage there. So was there a section in these case books on presidential authority and national security? Sometimes not at all. The most fulsome discussion I discovered was in uh, a case book that had indeed been the leading case book up until a few years uh, before I did the survey. It had a page and a half. Now think about this. The implicit message that students were receiving, and for better or worse, law school tends to have a significant shaping effect on how lawyers then go and think about their job and, and the law. The implicit message was that there isn't really any constitutional law of presidential authority, at least with respect to national security. You might say, well, but what about since September 11th, 2001? And the answer is the casebooks have changed. They have all got now significant sections on this matter. And the only thing in those sections are the Supreme Court's detention cases. Those cases are important. They have things to say about issues beyond detention. Detention and all the issues surrounding it are important questions. They are a very small segment of the overall domain. And so the implicit message to students now is there is a constitutional law in this area, and it has entirely to do with whether people can be kept in Guantanamo and whether they can bring habeas corpus actions. Well. This obviously is, of course, the wrong message. As I just said, as I said at the beginning, the Constitution is the framework for all of the decisions the U.S. government and all of its parts, including the United States Armed Forces, make. There is necessarily and unavoidably a constitutional law of national security and presidential authority. Well, what's wrong with the casebook editors? What's wrong is that they are typical, good, smart, American common lawyers. Common lawyers automatically think about cases. What do you do when you analyze a question? If you've been socialized in the common law tradition, you look for the cases. You, make, you work with the cases. 
If you don't have a lot of cases, then you don't have anything to work with. In fact, you might think there isn't really much law there. But that can't be so. See my point about the Constitution being the framework. So what do we work with? Well, we work with all the other things. We work with what case law there is. But we work with all the other things that constitutional lawyers appropriately work with, text and original meaning and structure, and also, centrally, political practice. Political practice, I mean by that arguments that look at what the legislative and executive branches have done in the past, how they have interacted, and what lessons we may learn about constitutional meaning and the Constitution's application from that history. That is a form of constitutional argument, and it is a form of great importance. And this is no, I'm not making this up or coming up with something modern. Um, the first uh, great acknowledgment of the importance of political practice in our history from a court was in a case you may have heard of, if you're a lawyer, McCulloch against Maryland, 1819. Chief Justice John Marshall says, talking about the Constitution, on a doubtful question, one on which human reason may pause and the human judgment be suspended, in, in an issue on which the respective powers of those who are equally the representatives of the people are to be adjusted. That is to be thought about, and it may be indeed, if not put to rest, at least um, uh, considerably influenced in your judgments by the practice of the government. Political practice is one of the central forms of constitutional argument, and it comes to the forefront in the area of presidential authority and national security precisely, well, not precisely, in part because there isn't a lot of Supreme Court case law. Now, this is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing because one of the great dangers, a couple of the speakers yesterday reminded me of this, which made me a little nervous as I thought, I wonder if my whole talk is a bad idea. Um, <laughs> Good thinking in this area needs to avoid abstraction, overgeneralization, uh, dogmatic pronouncements based on theory. Sound, excellent, good, faithful constitutional reasoning as part of, only part of, but as an essential part of national security legal thought uh, has to avoid those errors. And political practice arguments, if they're done well, do that because they supply meat on the bones. They provide detail. If you do them well, they involve thick descriptions of what Congress and the presidency and the rest of the executive branch were doing in a circumstance, in a situation, how people thought about things, what the relationship was between political talk and legal thinking and actual decision. So political practice arguments done well give us a sound and non-abstract basis on which to think about uh, the normative questions with which we must deal. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that just because it's been done in the past, it's therefore constitutional. John Marshall didn't mean that. But it does mean that we, there's much to be learned and much to be said as we try to reach the best decisions. Uh, uh, on these matters uh, for this republic. And let me say one thing about uh, these wonderful conferences. One of the things that strikes me about these conferences is that uh, throughout them, Charlie, and this is, this is largely due to you, one has a sense that you've got a group of people who are working together. These are common problems. We don't all agree. We're not going to all agree on the answers or sometimes even how to address them, but we're working together on common problems. And that's a, that's a fabulous aspect of, I think, the national security law community in general uh, and of this conference in particular. OK, so let me give you a little bit of ancient history. I always, when I mention the person I'm about to mention in my law school classrooms, I always do this. George Washington. <laughs> President Washington's uh, presidency, this is sometimes forgotten, was a presidency in which many 
of the biggest and most difficult decisions were national security decisions. Now, it's a very different world. Yes, I understand that. We can't directly take what President Washington thought about handling unrest on the frontier with Native Americans to what we do in Afghanistan. But what President Washington did and what Congress did in his context are directly relevant to how we should think about our questions in 2014. <clears throat> all right, it's August 1789. The United States has, as a uh, legacy from the uh, Articles of Confederation, an army. It's about 600, I think it was 672 persons, most of them on the Pennsylvania frontier. It's not clear they're going to be there much longer because Congress hasn't yet said anything about them. And if Congress doesn't soon do something, they're going to just disband. And there are lots of people who think that's exactly the right answer. In this republic, we can and should rely on the militia if we need military force. President Washington is of a different view. And he calls on Congress to authorize, the continue, in effect, the continuance of the Confederation Army. There's a debate in Congress. There are people who say no, there are people who say yes, but we need to be very careful in letting the, telling the president what he can and cannot do with this little army. Well, they didn't say little army, with this threatening standing army, all 672. Um, in the end, Congress authorizes the army, appropriates funds, uh, and doesn't put any particular restrictions on the president under in the statute statutes. <clears throat> Part of that is because the people objecting to putting such restrictions on the president include one fellow you may have heard of in the House, James Madison. Madison says, if we authorize the army, then by the Constitution, the president has the power of employing these troops in the protection of those parts of the country which he thinks requires them most. And this pattern of the president identifying and stating national security issues, of Congress taking seriously the policy and constitutional questions, and then in general, in the Washington days of, um, of approving what the president wants or agreeing with him, this becomes, without trying to hamstring presidential discretion, this remains a pattern for the rest of the Washington years. In fact, in a way, it becomes a pattern that has another side to it because precisely, I think, and because Washington is getting congressional feedback and congressional engagement, Washington himself responds by a deep concern about the proper use of his discretion. As time goes on, he becomes concerned to make sure that he does not exploit the absence of statutory restrictions in ways that are inappropriate constitutionally. So that by 1793, in a private letter, there's no reason to doubt that he means exactly what he says. He says, we really need to undertake offensive expeditions against the refractory part of the Creek Nation. But we can do so only and whenever Congress should decide that such a message be proper and necessary, such a measure be proper and necessary. So what you see, and this is a pattern too, is the interaction between the executive taking seriously its role and the Congress taking seriously its role, the Congress recognizing the need for executive discretion, and the executive recognizing the need not to exploit that, not to rely on claims of necessity in making decisions. And Washington was not, let me just underline, <clears throat> Uh, sitting around necessarily waiting for the lawyers to conclude things if necessity demanded. And there are big questions there that Washington was deeply aware of. Washington, in fact, ordered uh, action uh, by the Confederation Army before Congress reapproved, uh, reauthorized it. Let me give you one other instance uh, from this ancient history. February 1793, revolutionary France declares war on the United Kingdom. The French position is that the 1778 Treaty of Alliance with the United States obliges the United States to come, to come into the war on France's side. Britain, unsurprisingly, has a different view 
and Britain has the Royal Navy. This is an incredibly difficult situation for the administration, one in which the very survival of the United States may be at stake. It's a different world than ours, but the issues are every bit as pressing. In April of that year, famously, Washington proclaims that unless Congress speaks otherwise, the United States will be neutral and will respect its obligations as a neutral. Somewhat less famously, the Washington administration determines to take active steps to ensure American neutrality, including, if necessary, and this would, the French are the danger here because they're wanting to outfit privateers in American ports, including, if necessary, what one member of the cabinet calls military coercion against the French. There's an incident I want to close with. In early July of 1794, this is uh, over a year later, uh, there's a ship in the port of Philadelphia that's being outfitted, and the administration determines that it's being outfitted to serve as a French privateer. The administration has no confidence that the French will respect an order not to depart. There's a question, there's a problem about what to do. The cabinet unanimously, including Thomas Jefferson, who was both the most Francophile and the most uh, dovish member of the cabinet, the cabinet unanimously concludes that it would be constitutional for the president, for the executive, to take military action against the privateer in order to maintain American neutrality. A daring decision, in the end they didn't take it because events overtook them. A daring decision, one that reflected a deep uh, uh, commitment to the role of the executive in defending national security, and one that was taken because we, we have the, the uh, members of the cabinet produce two opinions for the president on the legal issue, one in which we know that the internal debate within the administration was one of we have a military necessity and we have the constitutional necessity, necessity to take action within the framework that the Constitution creates, which of course always involves Congress. Ancient history, does it answer our questions? No. Does it indicate, I think, some very significant ways in which we should think? I think so. Thank you. And uh, along with Jeff and the others, thanks, Charlie, for the invitation to talk to you. And it's uh, great to see so many people here this morning. In keeping with the uh, theme of the conference, I'm going to tell you a law-shaping story about presidential authority. Chapter 1 opens in the early days of the George W. Bush administration. But there's a prologue. The prologue is Watergate and its aftermath. So after President Nixon resigned and Gerald Ford assumed the presidency, Congress was very much engaged in asserting its authorities under Article I in a number of areas. It passed the War Powers Resolution, among other things, uh, in part in response to what it saw as uh, the, 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 the dangerously close uh, we had come to an unstoppable imperial presidency. Um, there soon set in a, among um, a number of influential people a point of view that, in fact, the presidency, uh, whether or not it was imperial in the days of Richard Nixon, was being too weakened by congressional action and by the willingness of the executive branch to go along with measures that encroached on the president's legitimate constitutional authorities. Um, Justice Scalia, who was head of the Office of Legal Counsel at the time in the Ford administration, if you get him in a comfortable chair with a cigar, will ask you the right questions, will tell you that one of the activities that he enjoyed least during this period in the, his uh, tenure in the Ford administration was going over to the White House with some regularity and agreeing with or being talked into by others uh, sending what he considered to be state secrets to the Congress because President Ford had taken the 
position that he was going to do whatever it, he could to rebuild a very tattered relationship between the two institutions. So he never exerted, he never asserted executive privilege. He was as compliant and agreeable as he possibly could with the Congress. And a number of observers developed the attitude that, in fact, uh, this was this uh, cooperative uh, posture was being uh, on the verge of becoming subservient in a way that was inconsistent with the constitutional design. Out in the academy and in the think tanks, books with titles like The Fettered Presidency were being written, and the, this whole uh, specter of a hamstrung, feckless, disempowered president was being taken quite seriously. So that's the prologue. We now enter the early days of the Bush administration. We find in positions of influence a number of graduates of that era. Dick Cheney was uh, President Ford's chief of staff. Donald Rumsfeld was around. Um, David Addington was uh, a little bit young to be an active participant then, but he had been the chief counsel for the minority in the House when Congressman Cheney and he authored a very strong minority report to the Iran-Contra study that put forward this, this theme of uh, an embattled presidency and concern about congressional encroachments on the presidency. And it seems clear now in retrospect and from news reporting and memoirs that are, are coming out that without a doubt there were people in the administration who uh, had as a definite priority on their agenda restoring what they saw to be the proper scope of presidential authority. You can trace this in events that took place even before September 11th in things like the um, the stone wall, if you will, that the, 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 um, it, that the White House put up to any inquiry by the Congress into the Cheney Energy Task Force and getting access to even the most rudimentary documentation about that. But put the domestic issues aside and focus on the national security issues, which became full focus after the events of September 11th. Now, this is an area of national security in which um, even the most uh, supine congressional lapdogs will concede the President has substantial autonomous authority to act. Um, these are also areas in which the American people have long expected Presidents to act and act decisively. So standing on a very firm foundation, the idea of pushing forward aggressively in the assertions of presidential authority in the national security area must have seemed both terribly right and just in the circumstances where the anxiety levels, as most people in this room remember immediately after 9-11, were enormous. The sense that we didn't know what was going on at an intelligence level were huge. The worry about a second attack was ever-present. A uh, massive reorganization was underway that continues to this day in outfits like the FBI and the NSA in terms of their orientation and, uh, and priorities in counterterrorism. So being forward-leaning in the expression of the day in trying to get on top of the intelligence situation and being aggressive in fighting back against um, a threat that we were only beginning to understand in its full dimensions must have seemed exactly the right practical posture to take, and it seemed also to be compatible with a very strong muscular view of presidential authority. Now, the boldest push in this area of presidential authority uh, occurred with respect to what Justice Jackson in his concurrence in Youngstown uh, refers to as uh, a third category of presidential authority, what the, the president's preclusive powers, his power to act even in the face of congressional, stated congressional opposition, certainly by statute and perhaps even by strong implication from actions that Congress had taken. This is the power that Justice Jackson described as um, occurring when the President takes measures incompatible with the expressed or implied will of Congress, where his power is at its lowest ebb, uh, where the Court can sustain his actions only by disabling the Congress from acting upon the subject. 
Many of the highly publicized and con contentious reactions and actions of the administration to the horrific events of 9-11 um, implicated uh, this dimension of presidential authority in the area of preclusive power, that is, the, the, the ability of, of the president in the face of contrary statutory directive simply to disregard or override that directive in the in interests of national security. Whether it related to statutes prohibiting torture or statutes prohibiting the detention of citizens being held without charges or statutes prohibiting communication surveillance in the absence of a valid intercept order from either a criminal court or the FISA court and others. Um, Within the legal arsenal of the administration, the operative theory of presidential power seemed to be that the president had the constitutional authority to act in the interests of national security in disregard of any statutory constraints. So to quote from one of the memos that was prepared by the Office of Legal Counsel with respect to, in this case, the enhanced interrogation techniques, part of it reads, the demands of the Commander-in-Chief power are especially pronounced in the middle of a war in which the nation has already suffered a direct attack. In such a case, the information gained from the interrogations may prevent future attacks by foreign enemies. Any effort to apply 18 U.S.C. Section 30, 2340A, which prohibits any citizen outside of the United States from committing an act of torture, it applies outside of the United States because we already think, already think the criminal laws on the books prohibit it inside the United States, in a manner that interferes with the President's direction of such core war matters as the detention and interrogation of enemy combatants, thus would be unconstitutional. So concludes the memo. Now, with appropriate changes, uh, this rationale is broadly applicable to almost every national security action taken by the, the President. Not as a first resort always. Uh, sometimes the statutes are in aligned with what the President wants to do. But it was, it was a well-developed, available card in the legal deck that the administration thought constituted the appropriate understanding of the President's authority that, that could be uh, advanced where necessary. This is not a novel view. Other people have expressed similar views down through American history. Uh, Wayne Morse, when he was dean of the uh, law school at the University of Oregon, advised FDR that he could take any action that uh, was necessary in the national defense leading up to and into World War II. Dean Asheson testified before a Senate committee with respect to FDR's powers to the same effect. Of course, President Nixon famously, in a David Frost interview after he had left the presidency, um, in response to a question said, if the President uh, does it, it's not illegal by definition. So uh, <laughs> this is not a, um, an unknown or unheard of um, position to take with respect to the President's national security and commander-in-chief authorities. Uh, given the context that we were in after 9-11, it became a rather pervasive background rationale, not always disclosed until well after the fact, but as we see more and more uh, declassified and otherwise published uh, memoranda from uh, the Office of Legal Counsel, uh, you can see lots of evidence of this uh, position. Now, and here's the law shaping. Uh, here's, this, here's the significant turn in the law shaping story. Um, this effort to gain a general, the effort to gain a general recognition of this kind of presidential preclusive authority did not take root in the, the case law. You can't find a decision by the Supreme Court that comes close to adopting this point of view, and only suggestions in a couple of lower court decisions that it might be something that a, a court would entertain. Um, now, many of the actions taken with perhaps this background legal justification in mind, were not litigated to, 
conclusive results on this issue in the Supreme Court. I think you can actually look at the cases and say, we have yet to have the knockdown, drag out fight in the Supreme Court about this theory, but it was available in a number of cases uh, and never taken up um, by anyone on the Supreme Court, including Justice Scalia. And then campaigning for the presidency in 2008, Barack Obama repudiated this preclusive power theory. And once he's, he was elected, it disappeared from the Department of Justice as a rationale for presidential action in the national security area. Um, interestingly, the Obama administration continued to pursue many of the actions and initiatives of the Bush administration, certainly Bush administration's second term. Barack Obama did not return to first term Bush uh, forms of enhanced interrogation. Those had already been repudiated by the Bush administration itself before President Obama took power. Uh, but many of the, just, many of the activities um, of the, uh, in the counterterrorism area that had been begun uh, and um, developed in the Bush administration have continued to this day. Indeed, some of them, such as the use of, of drones as an in instrument of uh, attack, uh, have increased. Um, the NSA's surveillance of, uh, of uh, communications coming into the United States from suspected terrorists outside of the United States, which was a source of great um, uh, objection by the civil liberties community when it was first revealed in the Bush administration, has in fact been continued by the Obama administration. But if you notice the rationales that the administration uses, the current administration uses in any of these areas, they are statutory in nature. And the reason for that is that Congress, when confronted with these questions and the exigencies that were presented in defense of why various actions had um, been undertaken by the Bush administration, at the end of the day, produced statutory authorizations for them. So the 2008 FISA amendments substantially codify the authorities that the administration lacked at a statutory level when the program was first begun under uh, Director Hayden in 2002, uh, but it continues now, not on the basis of assertion of presidential preclusive power, but on the basis of the authorization of the 2008 Act. And you can walk through other examples to this same effect. So this causes um, my civil liberties friends some consternation because when President Bush was acting lawlessly, the assertion was Congress needs to become involved and set the, set the legal regime right, assert its rightful role as a co-equal branch of government in managing such issues. When Congress eventually was faced with, and in some cases uh, compelled to take statutory action, it has produced regimes that are highly uh, similar to the um, produce statutory legal regimes that, are, that sanction activities that are highly similar, if not identical, to the ones that were taken under sole presidential authority, or which the administration was prepared to defend as being based on sole presidential authority. So at one level, the level of constitutional doctrine, the uh, effort in the 2000s to reshape our understanding of the dimensions of preclusive presidential power did not succeed. The, the, the uh, state of our understanding, I think, of what it means to have the president's power at its lowest ebb has not been substantially transformed as a result of all of the counterterrorism and um, national defense activities since 9-11. What has occurred is that we have established a statutory regime that is largely um, um, the, the legal basis and grounding for uh, what the administration, both administrations have viewed as necessary national security activities. So operationally, not much change between the, the two regimes, 
But as a question of law shaping, much more activity in the statutory area where, again, under Justice Jackson's framework, when a statute and the President's activities are in alignment, there the operative question is whether the, the Federal Government as a whole has authority under the Constitution to act. It is no longer a question of the independent authorities or separated powers authority of either of the two branches. Looking ahead, I think the Snowden affairs, the Snowden revelations may, I say may with a heavy emphasis on that qualifier, test whether this legal environment will persist. It will, whether it does test it will depend upon whether Congress becomes sufficiently concerned about the uh, nature of the surveillance activities that it has previously authorized to revise the statutes in a way that then causes concern in the executive branch about once again being fettered in what the executive would like to do optimally with respect to national security. And that is a very speculative may. It will require both the consensus of both bodies of Congress and the signature of a President who would be quite concerned if the legislation indeed attempted to significantly restrict activities which he and the armed services and the intelligence services are and telling him are uh, instrumental in continuing to defend the country. So we don't know whether there will be another chapter to be written as a result of Edward Snowden into this tale of um, what I will now call not reshaping the scope of presidential powers as it relates to his preclusive authorities. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, I'd like to add my voice to, to those of Jeff and Chris in thanking um, Charlie for the invitation. Um, I'm, I'm always happy to come back to Duke. It's always wonderful to be here among friends and colleagues and among the, the terrific audiences that always turn out for Duke events. Um, but I'm especially honored to be here in connection with the celebration of the anniversary of the Center for Law, Ethics, and National Security. Um, and I'd like to commend Scott Silliman for all of his terrific work in building the center and Charlie for his really great work in running with that legacy. So thank you for, for having me here. Um, I, I'd like to pick up on the comments that both Chris and Jeff made. Um, Chris, I think, persuasively sets forth a description of two different approaches to questions about presidential power, two different approaches that have obtained since 9-11, right? On the one hand, there's the, the, the approach that says, in essence, the president has the constitutional authority to do whatever the president wants to do in order to protect national security, that statutes cannot constrain the president, um, and so laws forbidding torture, for example, don't apply. The president, if the president wants to initiate war, the president can initiate war and doesn't need to go to Congress to get a previous authorization, right? That, that's one view of presidential power. That was the view that um, prevailed in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. More recently, um, President Obama has expressed his um, fealty to statutes, right, that statutes, in fact, can bind the president, and he, in fact, is bound by statutes. Now, that distinction between those two different um, legal views about the Constitution and the way it structures and allocates power between the President and Congress could be dramatically different, right? And I think Jeff's talk suggests to us that, they, that, those, di that those two different approaches can and should be different, that if the President accepts the authority of Congress to bind the President, that if the President accepts that he is subordinate to law, rejects the Nixonian approach that if the President does it, that means it's not illegal, right? That that, in fact, is a, con is a significant concession, okay? Um, and I completely agree with Jeff that that can and should be true, but it isn't necessarily true, right? And so to think about the question, I'd like to think about the Obama administration's 
um, approach in a specific context, right? And I, I take Jeff's admonition that we not think about these questions in the abstract because, well, that's rather ponderous and not likely to be very fruitful. So the particular context in which I'd like to consider what the Obama administration has been up to uh, is Libya. Right? And I'd like to think about two different times in our response to Libya, right? pre-April 7th of 2011 and post-April 7th. Right? And the, the April 7th distinction has to do with the nature of our operations in Libya. Right? So just to, to take a step back, right? the narrative, I suppose, should be, isn't the Obama administration wonderful? Because it has said it will be subject to law, unlike the previous approach. Right? And so, OK, let's test that. Let's take a look at what happened in Libya. So in Libya, in early 2011, um, there's significant opposition to the uh, regime of Colonel Gaddafi. Colonel Gaddafi announces that he is going to brutally put down the insurrection, right? He makes no bones about it, right? Those who oppose him are rats. The issue has been decided, and they will be liquidated, right? There's significant international response to these threats, right? Gaddafi is quite serious. Everyone understands he's serious about this. And so his threat of catastrophic humanitarian response um, is a serious one. The UN adopts a series, and the UN Security Council adopt a series of resolutions condemning Gaddafi, authorizing uh, member states to use force to enforce a no-fly zone. The, the idea of the no-fly zone then is to debilitate um, Colonel Gaddafi from his ability to carry out his threats. And the U.S. gets involved, in fact, is heavily involved in establishing and enforcing that no-fly zone, right? The president takes that decision. The Office of Legal Counsel wrote an opinion authorizing the president to go ahead with that operation, okay? So the first thing I'd like to do is to consider that opinion, okay? Now, the opinion itself, I think, is deeply troubling, right? And it's deeply troubling because of the ways in which it's, I think, unprecedented if we take the approach that, that Jeff has, I think, rightly suggested, which is to take a look at the practice of the executive branch and what that practice actually sanctions. Okay, so the opinion says that the president, that practice establishes that the president may, absent statutory prohibition. The president may take military action for the purpose of protecting important national interests. Right? Now, that might be true if we pay very close attention to what we think are important national interests. Okay? So the president acting unilaterally, I think, has always been understood to have some authority to deploy U.S. military force without previous authorization from Congress. Okay? The Constitution says that Congress shall have the power to declare war. One could take an absolutist view and say that unless Congress has authorized a war, then the president has no authority to use troops. Right? But no one has ever thought that that's true. Right? At the very least, everyone has always thought, the framers have thought, President Washington has always thought, <laughs> That, that the president can deploy the military to repel a sudden invasion, right, where Congress doesn't have the time to respond to the invasion, or if we go down into the bunker with Chris and we're imagining situations where the government is decapitated, Congress can't respond, right, the president can order the use of military force to respond. So there is some space between a declaration of war and at the other end, no deployment of force where the president can act. The question is, when can the president act without prior authorization, specific authorization from Congress? And that's a question that has plagued or presented itself to virtually every administration from George Washington on. Um, and there is a substantial body of practice 
interpreting the President's authority in that context. There is, as Jeff points out, if you look at the case books, there is virtually no judicial precedent addressing this question, right? But there is significant executive branch and congressional practice in the area. What that practice certainly establishes is, as I have indicated, the President can use military force to repel a sudden invasion. The President can deploy military force in a situation of anticipated hostilities to protect American citizens, to protect their lives and their property, to retaliate against anyone who threatens or, um, or actually goes and impairs American lives and property, right? and to protect against imminent threats to U.S. national security. Right? The opinion on Libya then cites a number of instances in recent history when the President has deployed military force without specific authorization from Congress. Okay? The opinion primarily discusses deployment in Somalia in 1994, in Bosnia, in Haiti, I'm sorry, Somalia in 1992, Haiti in 1994, Bosnia in 1995, and the bombing of Kosovo in 1999. None of these situations describes precisely the Libya situation. In Somalia, there were U.S. nationals in Somalia involved in humanitarian efforts who were threatened by the situation there. Right? Moreover, um, there were statutes on the books that authorized the U.S. action. Now, the statutes on the books were not hard law, right? So there was funding available for operating in Somalia, and a sense of the Congress resolution said that those funds should not be used unless certain conditions were met. All of the conditions were met. Okay. And I'm sorry, that's the Haiti case. I'm sorry. Let me go back. On Somalia, there were U.S. nationals who were threatened, and there were actual statutes on the books that authorized the U.S. involvement in Somalia. In Haiti, there was a humanitarian crisis. We were invited to respond to, by the legitimate government, right, to respond to threats from illegitimate usurpers, right, and there was funding available, and the funding said that there were certain conditions that should be met before U.S. forces were deployed. All of those conditions were met, and so there's congressional support indicated in law for that operation. In Bosnia, we were invited by all of the parties involved in Bosnia to enforce their peace agreement. Right? And the Bosnian conflict involved the threat of spillover involving U.S. NATO allies with whom we have a mutual defense pact. And so that situation involved a threat to embroiling us in a legal obligation to engage in war. And then finally, in Kosovo, the Office of Legal Counsel found that there was, in fact, statutory authorization to proceed with the bombing mission from appropriations that were made knowing that the bombing missions were about to take place. None of these factors is present in Libya. We were involved in Libya to prevent a humanitarian catastrophe, to address a threat to security in the region, and to uphold the integrity of the UN Security Council. While those kinds of considerations have come into account, None of those considerations has been thought to be a sufficiently important U.S. national security interest without the presence also of threats to the lives and property of U.S. nationals or some kind of imminent threat to the national security of the United States itself. Right? 
And the problem, what's deeply disturbing about the Libya opinion, is that it does not take account of any of these distinctions between the situation that prevailed at the time of our Libya involvement and the precedents that it's, it says it's relying on as authority for that, um, for that deployment. Okay. The second time in Libya, the second sort of legal question that our Libya involvement raised was after April 7th, because after April 7th, our deployment receded in terms of its significance, in terms of its intensity. We receded to what we described as a support role, right? And so the idea was to support the efforts of other parties to enforce the no-fly zone. So most of the U.S. efforts at that point after April 7th involved surveillance, involved intelligence, right? But they also involved drone strikes. Um, the administration has described those as sporadic. I'm not sure how sporadic they actually were. We were apparently spending $10 million a day even after April 7th, so it's entirely possible that the drone strikes were significant and continuous. But they didn't involve, uh, they didn't involve dropping bombs from manned aircraft, right? They were unmanned vehicles. Now, at that point, the legal question became the application of the War Powers Resolution, which requires um, the President to consult with Congress, to make reports to Congress, and to cease involvement in hostilities within 60 days unless Congress has authorized their continuation. The President determined that, in fact, our involvement after April 7th did not represent hostilities within the meaning of the War Powers Resolution, and therefore it did not apply. Right? As a matter of statutory interpretation, that seems to put it mildly dubious. Right? We're bombing another country. How is that not hostilities? Right? We were enforcing a no-fly zone. How is that not hostilities? If a, no, if a foreign power enforced a no-fly zone within the United States of America, we would consider that an act of war. But we considered that in 2011 to be not war and to be not hostilities for purposes of the War Powers Resolution. What's especially problematic about that is not just that as a matter of statutory interpretation, the position is dubious, but how it is that the administration arrived at that interpretation. Right? The normal course would be to ask the Office of Legal Counsel, and then the Office of Legal Counsel would in turn ask various departments and agencies for their input as to whether what they thought with respect to whether or not our actions were hostilities, would ask for their factual input as to the nature of our involvement in Libya. The Office of Legal Counsel would then render an opinion, and the Attorney General and the President would receive that opinion. Typically, they would follow it, but the President would have the authority to reject it and follow his own legal interpretation if he wanted. That's not the, that's not the process that was followed with respect to Libya. Instead, the President and the President's um, White House Counsel solicited views from the Office of Legal Counsel, the Defense Department, the State Department, and independently assessed those various positions and determined to go ahead with this spurious understanding of hostilities for purposes of the War Powers Resolution. It turns out that, that, that the position that the President adopted was inconsistent with the advice being rendered by both the Office of Legal Counsel and the General Counsel of the Department of Defense, right? An extraordinary situation which, now, I don't know what's in the President's head, I don't know what's in the White House Counsel's head, but the facts lend themselves to the interpretation that the president was shopping for legal advice and that the president received happy legal advice from the Department of State that allowed the president to do what the president wanted to do. If that's the situation, then what, as a practical matter, is the difference between that approach and the approach that says, if, it's not, if the president does it, that means it's not illegal. 
right? Well, in fact, there may be one difference. When Richard Nixon says, if the president does it, that means it's not illegal, we know what the president is up to. When it goes through these Byzantine and non-transparent executive branch bureaucratic um, procedures, right, it's far less apparent to the public what's actually going on. And so from that standpoint, it's deeply troubling. Right, one last observation. Um, I know there was some discussion yesterday on a panel with, with judges, and that on that panel there was some discussion about judicial deference to the determinations of the executive branch. It seems to me that where the executive branch goes through the kind of contextual, historical, layered analysis that Jeff has been talking about and that I think is appropriate, you know, we can talk meaningfully about judicial deference. But where the executive branch doesn't do that, where the executive branch seems to adopt legal interpretations or historical and practical determinations that are results driven, that the case for judicial deference is significantly weakened. And I think we're apt to see that judges who witness this kind of procedure within the executive branch may become less willing to accord the kind of deference that in many instances heretofore they have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I have a question I'd like to ask all of you, but, but before I do, um, if Jeff or Chris wishes to respond to anything Neil said, I want to give you a chance while we're still on that subject. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, so, so my question has to do with the institutional structures we have in place in both Congress and the executive branch to address these recurring questions of the balance of power between the executive and the Congress. Um, Jeff and Chris in particular emphasized the importance of political practice in this area in part because of the dearth of, of judicial decisions to guide us. And so to the extent that that's true, that actual practice matters to what we think of as, uh, as the law, then each branch must be careful in every uh, encounter to stand up for its own prerogatives to the, to the extent that that's appropriate. Now, in the executive branch, we have institutions in place that create some sort of institutional memory. We have offices like the Office of Legal Counsel, um, that, that are staffed by a bunch of really smart people who are thinking about executive prerogatives, um, not just in the, in the immediate case, but also, I think, in the larger, um, the larger run of cases, um, taking us up to that abstract level that, uh, that Jeff cautioned us against. We don't have similar institutions in Congress. Um, we don't have an office in Congress who... Uh, that's staffed by people whose job it is to just think about Congress, um, Congress's role in congressional prerogatives. Uh, and so my question for the three of you is, is whether you think that difference in institutional structure plays into these, um, these encounters between Congress and the executive branch in a way that, that tends to work to the advantage of the executive. Um, Adding to that the fact that Congress is a multi-member body and the executive is a, um, the executive to me seems seems better situated to protect its um, its powers than than Congress does, and so so first question is whether you agree with that, and the second is if you do, why do we not see the pendulum swinging even farther than it has in favor of executive power, uh, as as against congressional power um, or is the pendulum actually quite far in favor of executive power and we just can't see it because of, um, because of moves like, like Neil described? I, I do think that the um, president is better situated to protect his institutional interests and provide an interpretation of events that are consistent with uh, presidential authority than the Congress. Um, Congress is a they, not an it. It's frequently divided. It doesn't have the institutions in place that do this kind of analysis. It doesn't lack them entirely. The Congressional Research Service is a very capable body that when interrogated by a member, the leadership can produce very sensible legal analysis of past practices. 
I, do, I, do, I think one admonition that comes out of the observation is you just have to be very careful about how you interpret practices. The fact that a Congress has not responded adversely to something the President does should not willy-nilly be taken as having agreed with it. There are lots of reasons that the Congress will stand silent. So you need to be careful at that level of what exactly the practice means if what you're interested in is looking back on patterns in which the two branches have come to some working understanding about the scope, what the scope of their respective authorities is. Has the pendulum strong? Why doesn't the pendulum swing any farther? Well, we have, uh, to some degree, our friends in the third branch of government to thank for that. Um, not exclusively, but I think the, the track record of the litigated cases in the last decade or so uh, has been one that shows um, the, the judiciary is not um, terribly amenable to arguments of exclusive presidential authority. Um, but in part, we have our friends in the Congress to think about it, because <laughs> oftentimes they will, as I said in my remarks, they will supply a statutory underpinning for something the executive is interested in doing. It turned out the authorization of the use of military force was one of the most generative pieces of law that we have ever enacted. It is, it is the statutory rubric under which a huge number of the most contested programs of the uh, Bush administration were ultimately justified. It was the reason we could indefinitely detain without any other existing statute. It was the reason we could override 1001A, which prevented the detention of, of, of citizens in the United States without a charge. The court interpreted the AUMF to be um, a statute that allowed in narrow circumstances that very, very kind of detention. And, and so it goes. Uh, now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, you, you ha at some point you have to begin uh, you have to get to the level of what your view of the substantive policies are. I mean, if, if you really think the NSA's uh, metadata program uh, is um, too intrusive on the privacy values that we have in this country, uh, Congress is to a degree complicit in that. It might not have understood when Section 215 of the Patriot Act was being enacted how fertile a provision that body of law was going to be, but it has understood that for a while, and it continues to allow 215 to, to continue to be law in the books. I agree with what Chris just said, and I agree very much with uh, Neil's comments as well. I do want to point out a couple of things. One is that if you look at the early republic, you're struck not by the existence of unanimity Congress was a they, not an it. But you're struck by the way in which the seriousness of which Congress substantively discusses on the floor and in reports constitutional issues uh, itself created a culture of constitutional discussion from which you could from which you could work as a person in the executive or in the legislative branch or in the judiciary. You could work on uh, constitutional questions, legal questions more generally. Uh, with some sense of congressional involvement in that. Uh, you know, what happened? Well, some of that's Congress's fault. Uh, the early Congresses are models of deliberative discussion compared to what uh, often happens in our Congress. Some of it is the fault of our friends in the third branch. <laughs> uh, the, the <laughs> I'm sorry, Judge. Um, uh, I don't. I, I have a lot of sympathy with the distinguished uh, uh, members of the, among other places, the Supreme Court, who are suspicious of the use of legislative history for many purposes. But uh, I think that there's a sense in which the opposition to legislative history may itself be a deterrent from Congress taking seriously what I think is its deliberative obligation on constitutional matters because of the sense that the judges just aren't likely to pay much attention. And if I were a member of Congress, I would find that sense of, uh, of well, what's the use uh, reinforced when I uh, look at something like, and this is not to say whether I agree or don't agree with the Supreme Court's decision, but in the city of Bernie, the uh, Supreme Court struck down uh, the application of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act to state and local government. Maybe that's right, maybe that's wrong. The thing that strikes me about it in this context is the way in which Congress had done its homework 
This was a serious attempt by Congress to think through the constitutional issues. It thought about it a lot. It took testimony. It was clear what Congress thought. And if you read the opinion of the court, you don't get the sense that the court gave a flip. The, the judgment of the co-equal branch, the Article I branch, I think, after serious deliberation, simply did not count for much. If the courts can find ways to take more seriously uh, and to pay attention to what, the, uh, what goes on in the houses of Congress, then I think that, will be a, that would be a good way to encourage the houses of Congress to do what I think is their job and not being well done. Um, I, I, I agree with, well, with both of you, and I especially want to just echo Chris's, I think, really important point that you need to be very careful about what to make of what implications to draw from congressional silence, right? Because the fact that they don't have institutions devoted to doing this, they don't have an office of legal counsel, right, might alone explain congressional silence. And another sort of modern development is the development of the two-party system and the development of the president being the effective leader of his, to this date, party. Um, Right. And so the dynamic of that in Congress is if you're a member of Congress and you want to get reelected, you want the president to look good, right? And so your incentive is to support the president, and if the president is acting in a way that's quite aggressive, to support the ability, the authority, <laughs> the legality, the legitimacy of the president acting in that way. Um, if you're in the opposition, you want the president to look bad, right? That, that makes your party uh, do better in the polls the next time around and maybe gets you into the majority and gets you a chairmanship. So you want to stand up and say that what the president is doing is illegitimate and a usurpation. And I think that dynamic makes it hard to take very seriously what it is that members are saying in committees and on the floor, right? Because members of Congress who now are shocked, shocked at the executive usurpations of President Obama thought that President Bush was acting perfectly legitimately, right? And it works, it works the other way as well. Scott. <laughs> do you want to do this or? Well. Scott, why don't you start us off? You've done this before. question for you. you. You were talking about presidential preclusive authority, and, and you referred to the OLC memos, and I think you're specifically referring to the August 1st memo of 2002 by John Yu and Jay Bybee. Um, now, I'm under the impression when Jack Goldsmith went in that there was a distancing from that view in a specific memo, I think 2005 or 2006, where they basically said, this is no longer the view of the Office of Legal Counsel. And the investigation that was done on Bybee and you specifically cited flawed legal reasoning. Yeah. Uh, specifically, well, you go through and cite John Marshall's quote from in Curtis Wright, uh, you know, exclusively, but you never mention steel seizure, which Jeff talks about so much in, in his book. So m my question is, isn't the preclusive presidential authority doctrine as, as set out by OLC in 2002 wasn't it just a blip that was later recanted by OLC itself? Well, it wasn't recanted in 2005. All the Levin action did was deem that section of the Bybee opinion unnecessary, and therefore we will rewrite it. And so they produced a, a, a second version that lacked the, the constitutional analysis. But the larger point is, yes, I think it was, um, I think when, um, uh, Steve Bradbury was leaving office. He published a memo that more directly repudiated or disavowed a number of opinions, a part of which was this aggressive stand on preclusive power. So yes, I agree with you. I mean, I, th I think it was, uh... yes, I agree with you. <laughs> Judge Sentel. Judge, go ahead. Ah, it's coming down. I might not need it, but I might. <laughs> you can shout. 
this was not intended to build off Scott's question because I didn't know what his question was going to be. <laughs> Neither is this intended as a defense of the preclusiveness, and I'm not going to take on the comments about the third branch, but Chris, in your, <laughs> in your discussion of the lack of judicial language concerning the preclusiveness doctrine, Scott mentioned Curtis Wright, which is what John Yu had relied on. As I recall, Curtis, that's dicta. I understand it's dicta, but as I recall, Curtis Wright, uh, President Roosevelt issued the uh, embargo, and then Curtis Wright was indicted for violating the embargo that was upheld, and although there was a statute on which the holding was based, Sutherland's dicta, in an opinion for a substantial majority of the court, seemed to say, did it not, that the president did have preclusive power, not just in national security, but in foreign affairs in general. Would that not be some, at least, Supreme Court language supportive of that preclusive power view that you all are saying there wasn't any judicial authority for? Again, I understand it's dicta, and I'm not defending yeah. preclusiveness, but I would suggest that there was at least some Supreme Court language out there. Would, would you comment on that? Yes, I, I agree that some have interpreted that language in Sutherland's opinion that way. It's also been given, I think, a softer interpretation. The, the sole organ um, plenary and delicate authority language, I think, is amenable to an interpretation that the, the, that the, the country speaks with one voice in foreign affairs, and it's the President's voice. No one else has the authority to do that. I, I, it is subject to a stronger interpretation. It's the, uh, that stronger interpretation is evidence in the, the 2002 memo that we've just been discussing. The stronger interpretation would be consistent with Sutherland's non-judicial writing, would it not? I mean, he wrote legal literature on the subject of international relations as well as his judicial opinions, and they were to the same effect, would it not? If, that's sort of like legislative history to say that, but <laughs> I'm not famous for what you're <laughs> Actually, Justice Sutherland's, the, the main thing Justice Sutherland wrote extrajudicially on the matter, which was a book, actually goes out of its way repeatedly to stress the importance and role of Congress and the legitimate constitutional authority of Congress. It doesn't provide much support at all for a preclusive interpretation. Judge Davis. Thank you all very, very much. Um, it was wonderful. Uh, my court in Padilla, the vote was five to four. Uh, and a number of members of Congress from 2001 uh, walked away from the uh, authorization for use of military force, at least as I understand it, expressed misgivings about, about what they had voted in favor of. So I'm going to ask the three of you briefly, uh, alone among all of us to go back in time and tell us what you would include, with knowledge of what has transpired, what would you have included in that bill that became the authorization for use of military force that was not included, if anything? What would you have included? Start with you, Neil. Okay. <laughs> I would have included a sunset. It's an incredibly difficult question, uh, which has, there are two warring things. We don't have a doctrine of statutory desuetude, so it's not self-evident how you can say that there's an end. And yet, as the Supreme Court itself has acknowledged obliquely in the controlling opinion in Hamdi, uh, in the Woods case coming out of World War II, in cases that Justice Holmes wrote for the court, coming out of World War I, there has to be an end to war. And uh, so I, I agree with Neil. And I don't know how I would, I, uh, you're talking with the benefit of hindsight, I assume. Um, yeah. I, I don't know how I would craft the language, but it seems to me one of the defects looking back on the AUMF is that it was uh, too uncabined, uh, both in its time dimension and with respect to the theaters of operations that it opened up. I mean, it literally was a um, justification to chase unknown 
forces of un undescribed magnitude anywhere in the world. And once you appreciate the nature of the terrorism threat, you, you see how completely unbounded that potentially can be. We should have proceeded on a more one step at a time basis, it seems to me, immediately after not. This is hindsight. I'm not, I'm not accusing anybody of acting inappropriately at the time, because you recall those times. But in hindsight, I think we should have proceeded in a more one step at a time manner, and that would have engaged more executive congressional dialogue as the understanding of what the nature of the threat was and the response that was necessary to it became more fully developed. Uh, Dr. Will Curtis, U.S. Naval Academy. Uh, I, I'd like to uh, get your opinion because one thing that I've been puzzled about, I, I'm not a lawyer, I'm a professor of international politics, so uh, my question may not necessarily be a legal one, but uh, given the War Powers Act that was passed in 1973, I believe it was, uh, placing some restrictions on the presidential power to get us engaged in war. Congress put some time limits on that. I'm wondering why, over the period of time that that has been in existence and the time that we've had complaints from Congress regarding uh, presidential power and so forth, why hasn't that issue been taken to the Supreme Court for settlement? Uh, get the judiciary involved, I, I tend to think it's a lack of wanting to accept responsibility on either side in case of some catastrophic failure. What's, what's your opinion on that? Well, there were serious efforts made before the War Powers Resolution to get the uh, judiciary and, in the end, of course, the Supreme Court to speak to the legality of Vietnam, and the Supreme Court managed to uh, find reasons to deny cert every single time uh, over some complaints from a couple of justices. Uh, so that's one of the things going on. The justiciability problems, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard as so oftentimes uh, in these tough constitutional questions, which are real legal questions, it's hard for, to find a plaintiff withstanding and meet all the other requirements of justiciability. Jeff Korn, South Texas College of Law. Thanks. I thought it was really interesting. But one question I have, when I think of, when I look at the memo on Libya, and, and I could, you could look at any OLC memo, Somalia, Haiti, um, the Kosovo, or the, the Serbian air campaign, at some point you reach a point where you say it, it lacks credibility. And then in other aspects, they seem more credible. So for Libya, at least there was a UN resolution as opposed to Serbia, which there wasn't. And one of the factors is, that's cited is support for the UN. What is your thought on the, the, the kind of model of preclusive versus shared power as a risk assessment tool? In other words, that's how it strikes me. If you're a legal advisor to the president, that you're looking at this, and it's kind of identifying for you the, the, where the risk really lies. And in that regard, uh, the lack of, of congressional opposition really does seem to invite executive action. And when you couple it with doctrines of justiciability, especially legislative standing, I think that largely explains the ineffectiveness of the War Powers Resolution, because how can a legislator complain about violating the War Powers Resolution if they haven't affirmatively voted to stop the president? So while I, while I understand the the, the theoretical challenges to this preclusive power issue. As a practical matter, when you read a memo like the OLC memo, what seems to scream out of it is, until Congress says no, the risk of initiating action is very low, because how is it going to be challenged? Oh, so you mean the litigation risk? Well, but the litigation risk, I think, is, is linked to the practical risk of are we going to be able to continue it? Right. So I think the practice is to take into account risks. 
I think the, the most important risk to take into account is the risk of the military action escalating into a war, right? Because then you're clearly implicating a power that is assigned to Congress, right? So that's something that ought to be taken into account, and I think frequently is. Um, so the nature of the planned intervention, the planned military deployment, is very often a significant component of the executive branch's legal reasoning, right? So where we're rescuing the castaways on Gilligan's Island and there's no threat of war, right? We're just sending the Navy off to pick them up and bring them back. Well, that, that's one kind of deployment. But rescuing people from a hostile foreign power, well, that's a different kind of question. In that respect, it may be relevant whether we're using manned aircraft or drones, right? Because one might well involve a more significant risk of getting us into a situation that ties the hands of Congress in requiring them to declare war as opposed to another. Another distinction that the, that the opinions have thought is important is whether or not ground troops are involved, right? Because disengaging from hostilities with ground troops is much more difficult than with naval troops or with, with airstrikes. And so that kind of risk is important, right? The risk of adverse congressional action that seems in a lot of ways to be not a terribly significant risk, right? I mean, Congress doesn't vote to, well, first of all, it doesn't vote to forbid the president to act. And if Congress did, the president would veto it. So it would only be the most extraordinary of situations where that's a real threat. Um, the threat of cutting off funding is more possible, right, is, is because funding has to be reauthorized, right? It has to be reappropriated, so that, that could happen. But the idea of Congress depriving money to troops in the field, right, is so extraordinary that as a practical matter, I'm not sure that that's a very big risk either. So if we're thinking about it in those terms, I don't know that there's much to stop a president from saying, well, I'd like to use the military now and I'm going to. Right? And so what I think we should hope for is lawyers in the executive branch who take seriously the limits established by practice over history. I think we have time for one more question. Thanks, Thanks very much. Uh, my name is Albert Jan and I'm with uh, Naval Special Warfare Command. And I have an observation um, that I'd perhaps like a comment on. Thinking about the president qua commander in chief, uh, I, I often look to command theory instead of the Constitution to evaluate performance in the space between a declaration of war and an imminent attack on the homeland. I think that we absolutely pay the president for his judgment and individual leadership in that time where there isn't a book or a declaration. That is why we need an individual commander. If you look at the responsibilities of military commanders, if they overreact to a situation, their troops are dead and they're detached for cause. If they underreact to a situation, their troops are dead and they're detached for cause. So should be with the president. And do it in 90 seconds. <laughs> Justice Jackson, in the Youngstown opinion, talks about the commander-in-chief power as being analogous to or perhaps even shaped by the command function that one would expect to find exercised by the highest general or admiral in a situation. I think there's a lot to be learned from that observation of Jackson. Well, I'm afraid that will be the, the last word on this. Uh, I was thinking, wow, another video that I can have my students watch, and I'm starting to think, hmm, I do this too much, I'm not going to have a job left. <laughs> uh, but really, I, I know we have some undergrads in the audience who may be thinking about law school. This is what world-class law school teaching looks like. You, you have heard people take extremely complicated and complex law and precedent and so forth and distill it in a way that it's accessible to everyone. I mean, this is a world-class presentation. And I only have one question. 
Chris, can I take your course? <laughs> you fit, fit me in somehow. Uh, so we're going to take our break now. We're going to come back, and our next speaker is a Duke Law grad who is appearing for the first time officially in civilian clothes because he just retired yesterday. And uh, looking forward to our ethics presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs>